Hi, thanks for joining us for our Purdue Commercial Agcast. Uh, I'm Jim Minter, director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture. And we're gonna spend uh, a few minutes here talking about the coronavirus food assistance program. And with us today are a host of folks from the Indiana State uh, Farm Service Agency office, including Steve Brown, the executive director, uh, Caitlin Myers, uh, Susan Houston, and Greg Folks. So we're gonna share some details about the program. Uh, there are a lot of details to cover, so we won't cover every single detail, but we'll give you an overview of the program, uh, learn a little bit about how you apply, I'll learn a little bit more about the magnitude of the payments that people might be able to receive uh, and also provide some information about where you can go to get more details uh, as well as a, a worksheet uh, uh, on the website uh, where you can actually start to do some computations. So with that, I'm going to throw it to you, Steve. And, uh, um, you know, this is really a, a significant program that's going to provide quite a bit of help to Indiana uh, agricultural producers. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Thank you for doing this and hosting it and helping us get get the word out to our customers and really try to, to get this program administered. As you mentioned, CFAT provides direct assistance to agriculture producers impacted by the effects of the COVID-19 outbreak. This is a little different in the funding. Uh, there's two funding sources. Overall, the CARES Act provided $19 billion, $3 billion of that going to food purchases in that area, and the remaining amount going to uh, uh, our disaster loss programs, uh, price loss programs. Uh, the CARES Act provides $9.5 billion, and the CCC Charter Act provides $6.5 billion, making up for that that 16 billion that that will be going to this program. So I guess for clarity, Steve, you know, if you think about potential losses out there, the losses could actually exceed the dollar amount that are available. But nevertheless, that 16 billion is enough to make a significant impact for a lot of producers, right? Yes, it will. And that's, Jim, part of the reason that uh, we're only going to pay 80 percent of these price reins up front right now. Yeah, because of the fact that total losses uh, once all the paperwork is turned in, might actually exceed the funding that's available. So this, uh, the sign up got started. Uh, we're recording this on the 26th of May. It got started today and extends out through August. Um, how do people go about applying? Well, we're going to be able to, you know, call your local office, set up an appointment by phone. That's how we're we're working. Our status is as of now. Uh, we're still doing no face-to-face -face, uh, contact with producers, but we, we are working with the phone. And there's also uh, a website, uh, it's farmers.gov forward slash CFAP. It's a great site, a lot of information. It's got a benefit calculator there that really will, uh, it's very self-explanatory. You can in your numbers in as we will tell you coming up here in the future but it, it'll process, fill the forms out for you. You'll, you'll be able to go in and, and see that. But I really encourage people to go to this site. And starting today, we started a CFAP call center. Uh, and it's, uh, it's had a lot of activity. It's a nationwide call center. We've had a couple of Indiana employees working it today and they were very busy. But that CFAP call center, the number to that is eight, Seven seven five zero eight eight three six four, and that'll give you the ability to call that center. And if you have questions, they can assist you. If you can't get through to your local office, but I encourage you to call your local office and get an appointment set up. Yeah, so a couple of great information sources. That website again, farmers.gov/cfap, and that cfap is C F A P or you can call that National Call Center at 877-508-8364. And we'll post that again, uh, I'll bring that up here at the end of, of our recording today. So um, so let's talk a little bit about eligibility. Uh, there's some, as with all USDA programs, there are some fairly strict res, uh, requirements with respect to eligibility. Walk us through that, Steve. Well, yeah, there's gonna be eligibility factors for the CFAP payment. A producer must have had a share in the eligible commodity on January 15th, 2020 and or April 16th through 
May 14, 2020. Uh, there's several uh, additional forms a producer must fill out, uh, whether he's a citizen of the national of the United States, resident alien, and that's a I-551 card, partnership of citizens or nationals of the United States, corporation, limited liability company, and other organizational structures organized under state law. Foreign person or foreign entity who meets foreign person rules according to 5PL are also eligible. So I guess I'd characterize that as being pretty broad, Steve. In fact, maybe a little more broad than the, under some other USDA programs in terms of eligibility. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it, it kind of hits every area, Jim. And uh, we, we've been operating off a lot of this type of procedure over the year. And as Caitlin will be coming up, uh, we've changed some of the payment limitation uh, eligibility for this program over our other normal programs. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about those payment limits. Uh, and you mentioned this earlier, the initial CFAP payment will be factored at 80% of the calculated payment. And that really accounts for the fact that the total funding authorized by Congress might or might not be large enough to cover all the losses computed under this program. Uh, Caitlin, I guess maybe you want to jump in and talk a little bit about the maximum amount that uh, a, a person or a legal entity can receive. Yeah, so just like our other programs that we administer, um, CFAP does have a payment limitation. The payment limitation is per person and legal entity um, of 250000 this limitation applies to the total amount of CFAP payments made re with respect to all eligible commodities that that producer is applying for. Um, we do have a new special payment limitation rule um, for this program, specifically for participants that are corporations, LLCs, and limited partnerships. Um, these entities can apply for an increase in that $250,000 payment limitation based on um, members' contribution of personal labor or personal management. So um, they can apply for up to two additional payment limitations, making their maximum payment limitation of $750,000. With the 80% um, payment factor that's applied, that comes out to be 600,000. Yeah, so just r run that by me again. So uh, I had picked up previously on that $750,000 max. Tell me again how that was computed and then how you get to the 600,000 potential maximum. The 250,000 is um, a per person or per legal entity uh, payment limitation and it applies to all eligible commodities. Um, so all are capped at the 250,000, the total amount of CFAP payments. Um, to get to that maximum payment limitation, um, this applies for corporations or LLCs or limited partnerships who have a um, members contributing at least 400 hours of personal labor or personal management. Um, if the entity has at least two members that are contributing at least 400 hours, um, they can get up to 500,000 increased on their payment limitation. If there are at least three members contributing that 400 hour requirement, they can seek an additional payment limitation of 750000 And then you got to the 600000 because you simply took 20% off of that 750000 to account for the fact that there might or might not be enough funding. So if there's enough funding, Correct. that amount could ultimately go above that 600000 all the way up to the max of 750000 If there's not enough funding, uh, you might wind up uh, maxing out at the 600000 that you just mentioned, right? Uh, let's see. Um, 
You might walk through that a little bit. I guess one thing to think about again is this is a little bit of this idea of getting at passive involvement versus more active involvement. And, and effectively, the hour requirements are a way of ensuring that uh, anyone that receives the benefits is really actively involved uh, in either the day-to-day uh, -day operation of the operation of the farming operation uh, or um, in the certainly in the management of the operation, correct? Correct, yes. Um, let's see. Also, we have we have um, what we call a rule of attribution. Um, payments are attributed down um, directly or indirectly to a person or legal entity and will be combined and limited to the per person or legal entity. Um, and we look th look at that up to um, four levels of ownership in a legal entity. And so explain what that really means to me. I guess that's a little bit unclear. How, tell me how that might be working in, uh, in operation. So um, as far as looking at four levels of ownership, um, say we have a legal entity who is our participating producer, um, and there's some embedded entities in within that legal entity. Um, we are drilling down to those members um, at the fourth level membership okay um, and attributing our payments um, down to that level okay all right that makes sense all right so let's talk a little bit more about who's really eligible and it really ties back to identifying people that have suffered a loss and so the legislation and the rules that have been promulgated by usda are just really trying to identify who suffered a loss and then walk through that so uh, for the first one, who's eligible uh, uh, with respect to the broad list of commodities? So your producers who are eligible have to have an ownership risk of a, in the identified commodities that suffered the 5% or greater national price loss as a result of the COVID-19. Um, those producers, they either produced or they own part of the commodities of milk, non-specialty crops, livestock, and specialty crops. All right, so the key there is that 5% loss, and we'll talk more about that later in terms of how that's really computed, but that was uh, the basic idea, identifying commodities where there'd been at least a 5% price loss, and then try to uh, provide a way to, to help offset at least some of that uh, price loss. So, that's a little bit of an interesting point. And, and Susan, I guess I'm gonna ask you to follow up on that. So um, a lot of the questions I've gotten from uh, particularly corn and soybean farmers here in the Eastern Corn Belt that focused on the fact that given the time frame, some of the grain, some of the soybeans, some of the corn that they had in inventory was already forward contracted. Um, talk to us a little bit about how that's gonna work with respect to whether or not it was already contracted or whether or not it was uh, unpriced uh, prior to January. And January 15th is our magic date there that we're looking at. A new term we're going to use for this program is subject to price risk. That's going to be our clarifier on whether you're eligible based on the dates. So had um, you had forward contracted, entered an agreement or similar binding contract prior to January 15th, that grain would not be eligible or livestock um, or specialty crops would not be eligible because you had lost um, the risk to suffer any consequences of the price drop. So the next question I've been getting from producers is, all right, so it was forward contracted. Um, I still had ownership, but because it was forward contracted, it's not eligible for this program. What about grain that I had in the bin that was, for example, under a delayed pricing contract? Is that eligible? At this point in time, um, delayed pricing, we do not have an answer back from national office. We do know that people that have a basis contract, that grain would be eligible for this. So we ask people to stay tuned regarding um, the uh, I can't, hedging of it and um, the delayed pricing. Uh, hopefully we have that answer from national office within the next day or so. 
Yeah, so to clarify, we, we do know the status of forward contracted grain. It's not eligible, but it's still a little bit uncertain with respect to grain that was uh, under delayed pricing or hedged to arrive. Those are both still up in the air. And then you said grain that has been under a basis contract. It's your understanding at this point that that is eligible. So basis contracted grain is eligible. Uh, the other ones were waiting for an answer from USDA. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So how do you go about applying for the program? You can make your appointment with your office. You can go to the farmers.gov portal and fill out your application and fax it, email it, um, scan it to the local office. The form is an AD3114 application. There's one application per producer, so this would take care of all of your commodities across the nation. It is a producer certification. You're going to hear us say this repeatedly throughout the uh, presentation today. The producer is going to certify to the numbers and stuff that they are entering on this sheet. Um, they are going to be required if pulled for spot check to be able to verify those or if the county committee would request additional verification. Producers are required to retain the records for three years. Once they have completed their AD3114, they can submit it to any USDA service center um, across the United States. So for just a little bit of clarity here, we mentioned at the outset that there is the website, the farmers.gov slash CFAP, and they can access the AD3114 there. There's also a, a Microsoft Excel worksheet that they could use to, to do the computations as well. But that website is not how you submit. To submit, you actually need to submit it to a local USDA service center, correct? That is correct. And they can mail it, they can fax it, or they can scan it and email it to the local service center. Okay. And it would need to be there no later than um, August the uh, 28th. Okay, great. All right, let's talk a little more specifically about some of the individual commodities. We're going to start off with dairy, and, and there's a lot to cover with dairy. It gets kind of complicated, but I think the overview on dairy is that if you were uh, had an operational dairy in the first quarter of 2020, you're eligible for this program, correct? That is correct. So anyone who was milking um, during the months of January, February, and March are eligible for this program. If they dissolve their dairy during any of those three months, they are eligible for pounds that were actually um, milked during the months that they produced. And then I guess the first question I get from uh, dairy producers is, what about milk that was dumped? Because we had a period there where uh, it simply wasn't possible for many dairies to market all their milk in a conventional fashion. So what? how does that work? Any milk that had to be dumped during the months of January, February, and March of 2020 will also be eligible for this program. And again, that gets back to the self-certification, right, with respect to how many uh, how many gallons of milk, how many hundred weight were actually uh, dumped during that time frame, correct? That is correct. And when they fill out their application, their application will be filled out in pounds. Okay. Uh, and then the other question I've been getting is, well, what about people that were either in or out of dairy margin coverage, dairy revenue protection, et cetera? How does that fit in? Um, those programs do not exclude them from applying for CFAP. So if you were in the DMC or the dairy RP program um, or any other type of dairy revenue insurance programs, you are eligible for CFAP. Does your participation in those programs affect the amount of payment that you're eligible for? No, it does not. Okay. Um, so I think you kind of mentioned about the records and marketing, uh, milk marketing statements being used for the months of January, February, and March. So that's the what you'd use to self-certify. Those are the records you need to hang on to. Um, need records of anything that you might have had to dump during that time frame and hang on to that for three years. And that's key. And that's that's tr true of all the self-certification uh, information that USDA requires, correct, right? That you have to hang on to it for three years? That is correct. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about some of the complications that can occur. And, and uh, one of those, of course, is joint venture operations. How does that work? 
So for a joint venture operation that does not have a tax identification number, those members will apply separately for the CFAP program. Those producers applying will um, divide their milk out and apply that poundage on an individual application. So if Jim and I had a joint operation without an identification number, we would take our total pounds, we would divide that whatever our shares are, and Jim would fill out his application, and I would complete my application, and we would each submit those to the county offices. Okay, let's talk a little more about how this is actually going to be computed. And as Steve mentioned at the outset, we've got two different funding sources. Uh, one is from the CARES Act itself, and the other was from uh, the Commodity Credit Corporation. So how does that work? What are the different payment rates? You're going to see different payment rates as we go through here. We're going to talk about the CARES Act and the CCC funds. So for the dairy, for the CARES Act, we're going to look at your uh, production in pounds for January, February, and March. And that's going to be multiplied by 0 0.0471. And for part two, that is the CCC funds for January, February, and March. We're going to take your total pounds, multiply by 1.014 and by 0 0.147. And so those will be added news. together for a total sum payment. So the good news about those computations is if you download the spreadsheet, it'll take care of that for you, correct? That is correct. Yeah, so there's some details here. They sound a little complex, but the worksheet is designed, the spreadsheet is designed to uh, handle those calculations for you without having you uh, to get too worried about whether or not you're multiplying this number by the correct number, et cetera, it'll, it'll take care of that for you. So the key there is to have your production records handy. And, and from that standpoint, you'll be able to fill out the form pretty easily. Let's talk about the non-specialty crops or stated another way, the major commodity crops and wool. Um, what are the eligible commodities? Let's just kind of give off the list here. I think some people will be interested. Uh, there's about three that are really going to be of primary interest here in the Eastern Corn Belt, but and we've got listeners around the country, so let's walk through the, the various commodities. So our eligible commodities are malting barley, canola, corn, upland cotton, millet, oats, and sorghum. We have soybeans, sunflower, durum wheat, hard red spring wheat, and wool. And any crops that were certified for grazing are ineligible for the CFAP program. And the other thing that I kind of jumped out at me when I was listening to you was the fact that uh, you mentioned durum wheat, you mentioned hard red spring wheat, but of course here in the Eastern Corn Belt, uh, we primarily grow uh, soft red winter wheat. That is not eligible, correct? That is correct. It did not suffer the 5% price loss. And that kind of gets us into our next topic, which was how were the eligible commodities determined? And you kind of mentioned it's re really related to which commodities suffer the decline in futures prices, right? And those time frames again, um, I think would be helpful. So the time frame or way of comparison was mid January to early April. And, and why don't you give us those dates again? That's correct. The future prices were looked at for the weeks of January 13th through the 17th of 2020 and April 6th through the 9th of 2020. So they're taking, so they're taking the weekly average weekly of that uh, January 13th through the 17th time frame and comparing that to the weekly average of that April 6th through the 9th time frame to determine the magnitude of the price loss for each of those commodities and uh, the ones we just identified that listed were the ones that had a decline of 5% or more. And in many of those cases, it was more than 5%. So um, in terms of working through this, what does a producer actually have to furnish? So when the producer fills out the form or they work on the website, they're gonna enter um, their producers, their share other 2019 total production. It's also gonna ask for their share of their 2019 production not sold as of January 15th. 
And this uh, must be subject to the price risk that we talked about earlier. So any unpriced inventory um, or production subject to the price risk means any production that is not subject to an agreed upon price in the future through a forward contract agreement or similar binding contract. And um, production appraised from felled acres is ineligible for the CFAP program. Okay. Let's look at those payment rates. And uh, I've been getting lots of questions on that. Um, walk us through the payment rates. And, and I guess here in the Eastern Corn Belt, the main ones people are really focused on are corn and soybeans. Uh, for our listeners, we've got a, a slide deck that will be available on the Center for Commercial Agriculture's website. We've got all the payment rates listed, so you can look at those in more detail. But let's focus on uh, the ones that I think are probably of most interest here in the Eastern Corn Belt, and that's corn and soybeans. What are those payment rates going to be? For corn, your unit of measure is going to be bushels. For the CARES Act payment rate, it's 32 cents per bushel, and the CCC payment rate is 35 cents per bushel. And again, those two different payment rates are going to be handled by that spreadsheet. So if you're working through the spreadsheet, it'll accommodate that without you having to worry about which is which, right? That on is the soybean, correct. On the soybean side, what are those rates? For the CARES Act payment, it's 45 cents per bushel and 50 cents per bushel through the CCC payment rate. Okay. So this is where it starts to get a little more complicated in terms of thinking about the magnitude of the payment that you might qualify. So the payment formula uh, takes those payment rates, but then we also get into how much of our production is actually eligible for a payment. Can you explain that to us? Yes, and this formula, when you look at it to begin with, it's a, a little cumbersome here, but um, we have a cap that's not to exceed 50% of your total production. That is the maximum you would be able to earn. And then we're gonna look at your total production not sold as of January 15th. We're gonna use the smaller of those two and then take that times 50%, and that'll be your CARES Act bushels. In the CCC Charter um, Act payment formula is identical to that. We're gonna look at your 2019 total production. 50% of that is our cap. And then we're gonna compare your total production not sold as of January 15th. Use the smaller of the two and take that times 50%, and that'll be multiplied by the CCC rate. So, you know, if you think about it from that standpoint, the maximum payment amount is going to be figured on 50% of what you produced in 2019, depending on how much of that you still had at risk, right? That is correct. So our total payment's gonna be the sum of the amount coming out of the CARES Act, as well as the CCC Charter Act payment. Let's work through an example, because I think it'll make it a lot more clear to our listeners and our viewers um, how this really works if we do an example. And you've got an example that you did work through on soybeans, so let's walk through that. So in this example here that we're gonna look at in part D of the 3114 form, on soybeans, the total production for the producer was 6,500. And the total production not sold as of January 15th was 1,500. And when we start working down through um, the payment example here, um, we're going to see that in item 16, the production not sold, we're gonna enter the 1,500 bushels. In item 15, it's going to ask for your total production, and that's going to be multiplied by 50%. So the original production was 6,500, so the data is going to be 3,250. Eligible production will be the smaller of those two, so it's going to be the 1,500 bushels. Then we're going to take 50% of that and multiply that by the CARES payment rate. So that'll be 750 bushels multiplied by 45 cents. That'll give us a total under the CARES payment of $337.50. And then we're going to look at the CCC fund payment. 
We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take 50% of the 1500 bushels and multiply that by the rate. So 750 multiplied by 50 cents is gonna give us $375. And then the gross payment, will add those two together for non-specialty for soybeans on this example, the payment's gonna be $712.50. And so the other easy way to think of that is you think about these rates you could think of it as a blended payment rate. And from a producer's perspective, you've got one at 45 cents, one at 50 cents. The effective payment rate on a combined basis is just 47 and a half cents per bushel. And then of course, it's gonna be uh, based on the smaller of 50% uh, of your production or the bushels that you had that were uh, at risk, so to speak, in that January uh, timeframe. So that's a pretty substantial payment. Uh, maybe it doesn't, account for all the loss that occurred, obviously, in terms of the magnitude of losses that some people suffered, but nevertheless, a substantial substantial payment. Um, let's turn to the livestock side and walk through some of those uh, computations as well. Let's start off uh, talking about who's eligible on the livestock side. So an eligible producer on the livestock side had to have a um, share in the risk of producing a crop or the livestock and who is entitled to a share in the crop or livestock available for marketing or would have shared had the crop or livestock been produced and marketed. Contract growers um, who do not own the livestock will be considered a producer if the contract allows the grower to have risk in the livestock. So we're gonna look at livestock owners and contract growers who are at risk and have a share in the livestock available for marketing or would have a share had the livestock been marketed um, are going to be considered eligible producers. Livestock that realized a 5% or greater national market price decline between the average for the week of January 13th through the 17th relative to the average for the week of April 6th through the 10th have been determined eligible for the CFAP program. And your national payment rates have been um, determined for those price declines. All right, so let's look at the eligible livestock here. And I've been getting lots of questions about this. So let's dwell on the categories a little bit. And, and the part that's probably the most complicated is the cattle side. So let's think about the different types of cattle that are out there and how they're going to be categorized. This chart here gives us our eligible livestock and we can see that we have feeder cattle less than 600, feeder cattle more than 600, slaughter cattle, fed cattle, slaughter cattle, mature cattle, and all other cattle. And um, for the hogs and stuff, you're basically going to split those into two categories. They're going to be 120 pounds or less or 120 pounds or more. For lambs and yearlings, they are any sheep that are two years old, less than two years old. In our additional slides we have, we can get into the definitions um, for our feeder cattle. So. Um, you're going to have feeder cattle less than 600 pounds. That's that one's pretty easy to figure out. The next one is feeder cattle 600 pounds or more, and that is in referencing to cattle weighing more than 600 pounds, but less than slaughter cattle fed cattle as defined. And so for clarity there, if, if your feeder cattle 600 pounds or more essentially goes up to slaughter cattle weight, which in this context is gonna be figured as 1200 pounds. So it's really 600 up to 1199 pounds uh, to be in that feeder cattle category. Is that correct? Um, on the feeder cattle and the slaughter, um, that is actually um, it's an average weight of 400, and that can be anywhere from 1,200 to 600 pounds slaughter weight on there. So that's going to come back to that producer certification on where he thinks that that calf is actually finished at. Okay, so let's maybe make that a little more clear. Slaughter cattle or fed cattle are cattle that have an average weight in excess of 1,400 pounds and which yield an average carcass weight in excess of 800 pounds and are intended for slaughter. So that leaves a little bit of wiggle room there, I guess. So maybe explain that a little more clarity for us. 
This definition was established based on NAS cattle slaughter data and the 1,400 pounds referenced in the definition is used as an average weight of 1,200 to 1,600 pounds um, for that slaughter cattle, fed cattle category. Um, and so that producer can certify any of that inventory that's considered finished for cattle weighing between 1,200 to 1,600 pounds and reaching an optimal combination of weight, muscle, and fat and are ready for slaughter. And so that term applies to cattle that, that were gonna either in that category on January 15th or would have been or did reach that category um, prior to April, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And the April date again that they're using would be what? Um, April 15th. 15th. So cattle that fit into that category anytime during that uh, roughly three month time frame would be categorized as, as slaughter cattle or fed cattle. Okay. What, about what about the other categories for cattle? We have, we have slaughter cattle, mature cattle, and that's going to be cold cattle raised or maintained for breeding purposes, but which were removed from inventory or intended for slaughter. Um, that could actually um, put some cold dairy cows and stuff into that category. Um, that'll be the only time we will have dairy cattle um, showing up on the livestock side of things. Any other time the dairy cattle are gonna be, be seen for dairy production. Then all other cattle that we have in there means any commercially raised or maintained bovine animals not meeting the definition of another category of cattle in this rule, excluding buffalo, beefalo, bison, and animal use for dairy production. How about on the swine side? Swine side's actually one of the easy parts here. So for pigs, it's anything less than 120 pounds. Hogs means any swine over 120 pounds. And then the sheep are pretty easy also. It's anything less than two years old. And then on the lambs and yearlings? That's for any sheep less than two, two years old. Okay. So in general, livestock owned on January 15th and sold between January 15th and April 15th are eligible. Um, offspring born from that January 15th inventory, so those baby calves, right, would be eligible, uh, or those baby pigs. Um, and then livestock inventory owned between April 16th and May 14th of 2020. So that's a that's a new wrinkle. Tell us how that works. Yep, um, that wrinkle is going to come in here, and we're going to look at that a little more in depth when we look at how the money was split between the CARES Act money and the CCC money. Um, the top two bullets will cover um, the CARES Act money for livestock owned and sold between January 15th and April the 15th. And then um, the CCC money will cover that inventory owned between April 16th and May the 14th. Okay. And then your last category is livestock no longer used for dairy, but have entered the beef cattle market. Those are also eligible. That is correct. And then obviously, just as we did with all the grains, uh, all the sales and inventory um, must be subject to price risk as of January 15th. This isn't as common in the livestock side, but if something was forward contracted, for example, I presume it would not be eligible. That is correct. All right, so you've got some categories here with ineligible livestock. Maybe walk us through that. So ineligible livestock will be any of your dairy production. Um, so if you still have cows out there that you're milking, um, they're not gonna qualify under this side. They're gonna be under the dairy. And then any livestock purchased after January 15th, 2020 and sold on or before April 15th will be ineligible. And then livestock that has an agreed upon price in the future through a forward contract agreement or similar binding contract as of January 15th will also be ineligible for this program. And you've got some additional things with respect to dairy cattle. Yeah, the dairy cattle that are no longer used for dairy production and have entered into the beef cattle market are eligible for CFAP. So any of your cold cows will go under slaughter cattle, mature cattle. 
and dairy calves will fall under the feeder calves um, less than or greater than 600 pounds. And as a reminder, dairy cattle used for dairy production um, or intended for dairy production are not eligible for the livestock part of the CFAP program. However, their milk production is eligible under dairy. And again, we're looking at a self-certification process. Records have to be maintained for three years. So it's important to, to do your homework as you get ready to uh, submit a claim, uh, submit an application, uh, make sure you've got your records in order, and then obviously make sure that you maintain those for, uh, for three years in case uh, uh, you do wind up being subject to a spot audit. So, for more details about those producer and producer reporting requirements. Could you walk us through that? Yep. The following um, sales and inventory information is required from livestock producers for owned inventory of eligible livestock as of January 15th and any offspring from that inventory that were subject to a price risk and sold between January 15th and April 15th. And then and we then also have, have your highest owned inventory of eligible livestock that were subject to price risk between April 16th and May the 14th. So let's do the calculations here a little bit because uh, the payment amounts can be pretty large per head. So let's walk through those a little bit. Part one is the CARES Act fund payment. And this payment is calculated by multiplying the number of livestock sold between January 15th and April 15th. And this payment is going to be on a per head basis. So you must have had that livestock owned by the producer um, on January 15th of 2020. And then any offspring born from that same inventory are eligible. So Part you have two. a you have oh, a sorry. detail in there that, that I think is kind of important, and that is the livestock must have been owned on January 15. And of course, in the in the beef business, it would be not unusual for somebody, for example, to buy some cattle maybe in late January, early February. Those cattle are not eligible for CARES Act fund payments. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And then the CCC funds uh, payment calculations, that's a little different. That's a little different. Um, on the CCC funds, we're looking at the highest livestock inventory between April the 16th and May the 14th. And then that will have a payment per head as well. Let's talk about those payment rates. We look down through here, looking at the payment rates, you can see a significant difference between what's sold versus your highest inventory. Remember the CARES Act is for livestock that has been sold between January 15th and April the 15th. And for example, we can look at feeder cattle 600 pounds or more. They're $139 a head. And your slaughter cattle, fed cattle, they're $214 a head. When we look over at the CCC part two payment, which is for your highest livestock inventory between April the 16th and May the 14th, for um, all the cattle there, they are $33 a head. So that fed cattle payment, $214 per head is pretty large, but I think it is based on the fact, obviously, that we had that precipitous collapse in fed cattle prices and particularly fed cattle futures prices uh, during that time frame. Those are pretty big payments. Uh, feeder cattle, 600 pounds or more, $139 a head. So really does a, a goes a long way towards offsetting the losses that a lot of pre producers suffered. It doesn't uh, cover everything, but it, it goes a long ways. Uh, those are pretty large payments. Um, so let's walk through a, an application example here on the livestock side. We did it on soybeans. Let's do it on the on the livestock side. This is a screenshot of um, the uh, worksheet that's available off of the farmers.gov CFAP page. Um, in this example here, um, we're going to look under part one. That's the CARES Act. That's for sales from January 15th through April the 15th. And in this example, we have seven head of cattle less than 600 pounds, and their payment rate is 102. So their calculated payment is 714. And the slaughter, 
cattle, mature cattle, we had 10 head and they're $92 a head. So there's 920. So for the care side for sold livestock, that producer will earn $1,634. They're also gonna be able to file for the part two for the CCC payment. And that is for their highest inventory between April 16th and May the 14th. So this producer also had less than 600 pound feeder cattle, a total of 480 head on hand. Payment rates $33 per head. So there's $15,840 for that calculation. And he had 573 head that fall, fell underneath the category of all other cattle. Those are also $33 a head, and that makes that calculated payment $18,909. So our total payment for part two is $34,749. We're gonna add those together, and so before any reductions, payment limitation, or the payment factor, this application here will have a total of $36,383 on the livestock side. So to be clear, that 36,383 would be the total calculation. And then assuming you didn't hit the payment limits, you would re expect to receive 80% of that at this point in time. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And that's getting back to what we talked about at the very beginning. And that is the idea that the funding provided by Congress might not be enough to cover all the losses. And so the way that USDA is dealing with that is uh, uh, basically applying a limit of 80% uh, as an upfront payment, and then later on seeing whether or not the possibility exists of paying that remaining 20%. So let's kind of wrap this up. Uh, all the eligibility forms uh, related to CFAP have to be filed within 60 days from the date of signing the CFAP application. And Susan, you might maybe remind us what we're talking about there. So in addition to your CFAP application, you're going to need some other things on file at uh, your local USDA office. And, and what might those be? Those would be um, your 902, your payment limitation forms, your adjusted gross income forms. Um, if you were new to our system, we would need your direct deposits and um, an 80 20 47 gathering all your information those are some of the forms and stuff caitlin had gone over in the beginning yeah so just for clarity if you file here in the next week or so uh, let's say you file on june 1 that means you got to have everything complete by august 1 and that's even though the program doesn't uh, the final date of file under this program is august 28th but if you file your individual application on june 1 you'd have to have all of your paperwork complete by August 1, have I summarized that correctly? Yes, and that's an important change um, from most of our programs. Uh, the supporting documentation can come in at any point thereafter, but for this program specifically, you have to have all that supporting documentation in within 60 days or we will disapprove that application. So we want to make sure we get that done in timely fashion. Yeah. So that's an important point because you don't want to miss on that one. All right, so let's wrap this up. Uh, again, details available at www.farmers.gov slash CFAP. And CFAP is just C-F-A-P. Or the National Call Center is available, and that number again is 877-508-8364. That number again, 877-508-8364. And that's being staffed by uh, FSA personnel from around the country. Uh, and I think so far we've already had, uh, here on this first day, we've already had some FSA staff members from uh, Indiana participate in that. So that's been very helpful. And, uh, and obviously then you can also call your local office. Um, local offices are probably getting lots of calls so recognize that you are going to need to make some appointments if you really want to have some details and, and have people uh, maybe the local fsa staff help you uh, with specific questions about your operation um, one final point before we wrap up and that is uh, uh greg is on the line with us today and greg uh, you might talk just a little bit about the disaster loan program and how that fits in um, with this program all right, thanks, Jim. It's uh, what we have available uh, was it came out last Thursday is 
we call it a, we already had at FSA a disaster set aside program or a producer, it has to be an existing borrower could move a, a payment basically to the end of their loan if it was related to a weather related natural disaster. And what, um, what FSA did last week with the blessing of the secretary was come up with a special disaster set aside program um, where you could possibly move a payment to the end of your loan if the reason that you can't pay is related to the uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So um, we're not sure that we're going to see a lot of uh, activity in that right now because most of the 20 uh, payments due in 2020 have been paid. But that program will apply for um, payments that come due between March 1st, 2020 and September 1st, 2021. So um, if producers are still struggling come this fall, winter, or if they have payments come due in the middle of the summer, maybe they're not getting as many um, flocks for of turkeys or birds or whatever, um, because the integrators have slowed down, we might be able to help them. But um, every every it only applies, like I said, to, um, people that already have a direct loan with us and all of those producers in the next week or so are going to get a, a two-page letter, letter from FSA that outlines exactly what is available and how they can go about applying for it and what they might need to do. All right. All right. Well, thanks, Greg. Appreciate filling us in on that. And uh, with that, I think we're going to wrap up uh, today's programs. For more economic information, visit us at the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture's website at purdue.edu slash commercial ag. On behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture and everyone at the Indiana Farm Service Agency, especially Steve Brown, Caitlin Myers, Susan Houston, and Greg Folk, I'm Jim Mintert. Thanks for listening.